How are you, Mark? How are you going? I know you're, you've got a busy schedule at the moment. You've just come back from <laughs> Europe. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm not bad, man. Um, not too bad. Just it's a long way from Europe. And uh, I'm a little bit out of the loop of traveling and touring, you know, after the, the two and a half year break. So it's a lot, <laughs> but I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> That's good. And you, you just got back in last night, I think, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I was in Norway for a week. I had one show in Oslo. Um, supposed to DJ in Barcelona as well, but that didn't didn't pan out. So I was chilling in Oslo for a few days and then came back. Lovely, awesome. Well, thanks again for um, for, for um, giving us the time to to uh, uh, have a chat. And i have uh, been really super excited about this because um, I've I've kind of, uh, as I mentioned to you, I've been in the background, kind of observing your journey over the last year and a half, although I know this journey is um, in, in the Web3 space has been a lot longer than that, but I sort of caught wind of it. And um, so, uh, again, thank you for uh, being so open and public about your um, uh, journey in this, in this space and offering information because it's, um, I think it, it's been super helpful um, and, and it's a very interesting time for, for music and creators, and I think um, you know we're entering into a whole new new world. So I'm, I'm looking forward to um, uh, diving into this. So M- Mashy Beats is your label. You started it um, 2010. When did you and Mashy Beats sort of move into Web three and and take it from there? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I I guess the precursor. I mean, where does one begin? Okay, so before the pandemic, being that being our kind of marker post for so many things, um, a couple of years before that, I was I was hearing about various crypto things, Ethereum and Litecoin and Bitcoin. I didn't really understand it, so I I checked it out and um, you know bought a little here and there. And then there was a huge market crash in 2018 or early late 2017. So not understanding what anything was, it's like okay, I'm done with this. I missed the boat. Let me sell that and. And that was that. And then I would guess uh, probably late 2019, I was seeing like kind of little bits and pieces popping up here and there in the Web3 in the web three space, which didn't have that name yet. Um, there was some very early NFTs. And then it was more, I guess, the early 2020, you know, as the world shut down and everyone was looking at, you know, what are our options, especially in music, obviously, with all the gigs were gone, all the tours were gone. And so, actually, one of my first moves was to, um, and entirely relevant to what we're talking about, one of my first moves was to start my Patreon. And that was something I thought about for a long time. But the idea of, of doing like monthly deliverables and that kind of thing when I was on tour pretty much full time, all the time, just didn't seem very realistic. And so, once the world shut down, it seemed like this is the right time to, to jump into that. So that was a kind of a precursor into the Web3 space where I was able to really get a hands-on experience of community building and kind of digital content. And I think a lot of musicians went that route as well. I saw a lot of people, you know, kicking off Patreons and the like at the time. And so from that, um, around the same time, early 2020, I was seeing, I was seeing a few NFTs that I, I just didn't understand them, but I was seeing them. There's a sax player in LA named Sam Gendel. And he minted a, a video, like a very obscure kind of RT lo-fi video on a platform called Zora. And he minted the NFT there and someone bought it for one Ethereum, which at the time was about 300 bucks. And I was looking at that, not really understanding what the deal was. I was like, I can right click and save this. It's on my desktop. Like, what is this? How does it work? But there was something which made me curious. Um, I think... The fact that it was there and someone had bought it in this cryptocurrency Ethereum and that I didn't understand it was enough to motivate me to find out more. And so from there, it was really just kind of an experimentation um, playground. And you, know, you mentioned Mashy Beats has been my label for over 10 years now. And it wasn't actually until about a year later that that really kind of morphed from a label into a Web3 community. In the meantime, I was, I was working on my own projects. Um, I did a, a drop called Motherland, which was a, it's a 43 minute audio visual album. It's the first audio visual album on the blockchain. 
And that was an NFT collection where the film was an NFT. There were eight compositions in there. So each of the compositions was a music NFT. And it just, it, that, that was kind of my introducing myself to the space, so to speak. And so the idea of that was really exciting to me where, you know, you have a 43 minute piece of audio visual art. And if we kind of, you know, forget about blockchain for a minute and just look at the traditional ways of, of uh, distributing media, it's like, well, what are you going to do with that? I can put it on YouTube. Cool. What does that get me? Pretty much nothing. It means people can see it, but that's about it. Um, the audio, I could put it on like Spotify or Bandcamp and, you know, eventually the audio did end up on Bandcamp. But also in the meantime, feeling like there's a whole story here, like the Motherland as a project was really about, um, it was really about my Japanese ancestry and, and digging into the mythology and folklore of Japan and what that means to me. And so to, to, to create that and kind of manifest it in this audio visual album, the narrative is what makes it special. And if you just stumble across that on YouTube, the, you know, it's, I think it's a pleasant experience, but the narrative is what really has value. And so the Web3 space felt like a perfect uh, opportunity to be able to share that work in a way which preserved its cultural and personal value. And by that, I mean that it's a space where people are listening for stories and they're, and they're able to focus on one work at a time, which is mm. totally antithetical to Spotify, where you know, you get this ADHD of like, you know, 50 million songs a day or whatever. Yeah, I'm just, I'm obviously not, I'm not that number, but you know what I mean? Mm. And, um, you know, people can't kind of focus. And so nothing gets its fair moment um, or fair kind of, yeah, fair kind of shine. Mm. And so to be able to present it in a way where it's in a community and space where people are focused on what is this? What is this one piece of art? That's very valuable. And so that was really my introduction into the space and led me on to, to putting out more music NFTs and then further projects, which I don't know if I want to, you know, if you want me to go into the whole thing right now or if we want to get there. Um, but it led to a lot of different initiatives and different ways to use crypto as a technology where, you know, I'm sure we'll get into it, but I was able to, to buy back my back catalog from labels who controlled it using Ethereum. And I was able to, you know, convert Mashy Beats as a label into a Web3 creator community where I'm able to mentor and support others and, and, motivate and get, have my own projects grow. And the, the whole journey just kind of kept going and it gets deeper and deeper the further you go. It's a, it's a classic, you know, Alice down the rabbit hole kind of experience where the deeper you go, the crazier it gets and the more there is to explore. Mm. So it's been a really exciting last couple of years for me. And an interesting kind of, an interesting back and forth with a lot of traditional um, kind of music creators and the, the way people traditionally release their music and the conversations with a lot of people where crypto's got a pretty bad rap as far as kind of being a scam or being a Ponzi and all this kind of thing. And it, it's kind of like, for me, it's like the music industry is so fucking broken that if there's any possibility of a different option an alternative paradigm a different tooling i'm curious and this is absolutely that so you know anyone releasing music and distributing music i don't know why they wouldn't at least look at it and see what the possibilities are mm. i definitely think that um that that's what i love about it um and what i'm learning more about is the um this different approach and and this alternative because it seems like this is the answer that we've all kind of been waiting for like you know over the last 20 years since napster and you know like it's like you know this is the model that that's bringing us solutions i would go further and say it's the answer we've been looking for since the inception of the industry you know the music industry <laughs> was specifically yeah, created yeah. to mm. to exploit people who make music Mm. And so that started with, you know, at, at, the, at the whole, the inception of the industry, there were, it's like, how can we make money by exploiting these predominantly black American artists and, you know, pay them pennies on a dollar and then make all the rest of the money? How can we do it? And that became the music industry. So mm. for me, like, you know, Napster and what, what happened with what's, what, where, where, where we are now with Spotify, it's all part of the same story. And yes. so how do creators take that control? How do, how do creators have a seat at the table? of 
it's the only industry where the business side of the industry intentionally represses the the content creation part of the industry, which is wild. I, I find I find like um, after hearing your um, webinar that you did, um, the discussion that you had back in February with your community, um, what blew me away and what I found fascinating was the the, the selection project at the time. I know I know in in terms of Web three, we're talking five, six months ago is like five years ago. But um, the, this, <laughs> the, what happened in February, what you were describing, you were using this as an example, as a case study of showing um, the, uh, what can be done in this space. You know, they did this, you know, 90, this one hour mixtape and it went for, you know, um, $90,000 approximately in Ethereum. Like, can you tell me a bit about that? Like, that's just crazy. Yeah, that was a pretty magic moment. So, mm. Selection, um, they they put that put out this NFT on a platform called Sound XYZ, and Sound is a you know one of the leading platforms in the space for sure. And it's they they put out editions, which means it's not just one NFT; it's multiple um, you know multiple copies of an NFT in the same way a piece of art might be that. So you have a, you know, an artist doing a print run of, an edition, of a piece of work where there's 25 of them instead of just one. So it's the same kind of mentality. But um, yeah, Joe K from Selection put together this mixtape from the Selection community. And the really fascinating aspect is the smart contract technology. And um, you know, not to kind of get too technical on it, but a smart contract is essentially a if-then um, algorithm or, or code. So if this happens, then do that. And once it's deployed, it requires zero administration and the, you can't intervene in it. And every transaction is transparent, it's public. And so if we, for a second, kind of think of that, imagine if a record label had that, like, you know, record labels depend on humid administration. Sometimes, well, there's no transparency unless you audit them. And then if the record label disappears, so does, the, so does the, the revenue stream. But with this, a smart contract on a blockchain goes on for eternity. So it's quite a different proposition. So in the context of selection and their drop on sound, um, sound XYZ, every creator on that mixtape had, had a cut, had a, had a percentage on that smart contract. And the DJ, the, the curator, also had a cut. Now, that's unprecedented, full stop. And so when these, you know, when these NFTs got sold, and I, I forget how much in ETH it was or in dollars, but it was a su substantial amount of money, those splits, that money automatically goes to the, the wallets, the crypto wallet of every person on, this, on, the, on, the, on the smart contract. So it's not like you're waiting, you're not invoicing and waiting 90 days. You're not like, you know, giving someone your bank details and they get one number wrong and it goes to the wrong bank. There's none of that. It's just, mm. it's... It's automatic, it's transparent, and it's, and it's forever. And then the wild thing was that the, the drop sold out, so all the NFTs got bought, and then you have a second remarket, like a, you know, in traditional terms, like a second-hand market, I guess, or a, or a second buyer market. And every time someone bought the NFT on secondary markets, a percentage goes back to the smart contract. So these D, the, the, the curated DJs and the creators who are on the mixtape they're all on this continuous revenue cycle that will go on for forever. In in that NFT, like you've got the you've got the music. What else comes in that drop? Like what what other parts of the artwork and like for someone buying into that NFT, um, what what other uh, attributes and, and things that they would be getting? Nothing. <laughs> So there's a there's a there's a, a very a broader conversation in the Web three space about utility. Utility mm. is the idea where if I ha if I buy your NFT, your music NFT, then what else do I get with it? And in ge generally speaking, are you getting a cut of the master? No. Are you getting a cut of the publishing? No. You're getting essentially what is a digital collectible. So for the for the consumer. And this is like currently, we're talking about super fan level. So for the consumer who's a super fan, you get to directly support the artists you love. And then you have a one-to-one -one relationship with them too. 
which is mm. kind of unprecedented where it's it's mostly when I say it's unprecedented, I mean because it's platformless, which means say my Patreon, if Patreon was going to shut down tomorrow, that's gone. But with NFTs, it doesn't matter what marketplace they're on. They're on a blockchain. So the marketplace could disappear tomorrow, but the whole, the NFT and the relationship still exists. So sometimes people will do extra things now where it's like, maybe you get, um, you know, I've done some where I've, I've, I've given away a hand pressed vinyl with an NFT, or if it's mm. music heads buying them, maybe it's the stems or maybe more, what happens a lot now is the, you don't know what the utility is. So you might, you might buy the selection NFT. I'm being hypothetical right now, but you might buy the selection NFT and then selection might do a world tour. And they might say, look, if you've got the NFT, then you can just get your wallet to the ticket site and get a free ticket to the world tour. Like mm. they could do anything they want. Yeah. And it, yeah. it doesn't have to happen in the moment because the asset lasts forever. And your wallet is like every wallet is publicly readable. So they can just, they can, they can find your wallet and even just send you an NFT concert ticket if they wanted to or whatever it might be. You know, mm. the, so that kind of idea of what do I get might not be apparent at first, but right. the idea where, um, you know, I, I use this analogy a fair bit where um, in the NBA, they have, a, they have digital collectibles, which are NFTs called Top Shots. And they're basically like, you remember baseball cards or like sports cards. Mm -hmm. They're basically like a digital version of that. Like you, you can get the, some LeBron James slam dunk Top Shot NFT. And so there was one, um, LaMelo Ball did one, a young player. He was a rookie that year. And the idea was that you buy his NFT and over his career, which is most likely the next 20 years, that NFT basically gets you access. It gets populated with more assets, the highlights of his career. And that's an interesting proposition where the average, the average kind of consumer might be like, oh, I can just watch his highlights on YouTube. It's like, well, you can, but the, like, then why do baseball cards work? You know, it's the same kind of mentality. So it's like, mm. it's like digital fan clubs and super fans being able to connect with things they love through an asset that is truly unique in that if, I, if you and I have the same um, JPEG NFT or, or JPEG, but my one's an NFT and yours is not, but it's the same JPEG, then you, might, you can say, oh, I've got that JPEG, but if my one gives me access to go and use some amazing recording studio in Miami, you can't mm. get that because mm. your JPEG is not connected to the actual token, which is the NFT. Yeah, no, I love that. And I love the one-to-one -one, um, with the fan because, you know, traditionally, like, speaking to a, your favorite artist is untouchable. And now this sort of creates that direct dialogue or conversation with them and being involved in what they're doing in, 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 in some way. But wouldn't it, wouldn't it, like in terms of the um, uh, uh, additional sort of components that um, doesn't it help with when you want to create an NFT and get and build the community around it and, and for sales, wouldn't, wouldn't the, those extra additional things help like by offering that at the get go? Or is that just kind of not? Uh, or I mean, is that kind of just expected down the line that once you, you're in that NFT? The fundamental principle is the mu with a music NFT, the music is the utility. Got it. And so mm -hmm. anything extra is, is an additional bonus. And this is quite a, this is, this is a value proposition that, for example, you know, I, I'm guessing we're probably ballpark similar age. Our generation are not digital native. And so what that means is, that we grew up with physical goods and there's even, uh, you know, I have friends for whom they're like, you know, an, an MP3 is not even the real thing. They're like, if it's not on vinyl, it doesn't count. You know, there's definitely that, mm. that mentality is still there with some people. Mm. So if you follow that kind of mentality and logic through, you can get to a point where you can see the current generation who are digital natives, they've never had to deal with physical goods. They deal with digital goods. So when you can actually assign a digital good its own identity, like saying this is a certified, verifiable original, or it's the artist is saying this is the, the, the certified digital asset, that has value to a digital mm. native. Mm. And yeah. you know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's a point too where even 
you know, there's plenty of people who think streaming is just nonsense and they'd rather own their CDs and their, and their, you know, even their MP3s or whatever it might be. And they're not wrong. So, you know, whatever your perspective is, I think there's a relative perspective which says one technology is more bona fide than another technology, whether it's vinyl, CD, MP3, whatever it might be. And, and NFT is what that is in the blockchain space, in the digital space. It, I, love, I love how you describe that, like, it, because if, if it's, if, especially if you're coming from where you're just a digital native, then that, that old context is not even part of your blueprint, you know, like you wouldn't. So that makes a lot of sense. So if, if you're looking at um, for the diehard vinyl collector, you know, they want to get the original pressing, they want to get the, you know, the, 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 mm-hmm. the, the Japanese copy or, you know, they want to get, you know, the, those kind of things. It's the same, same kind of flex principle here, you know, like the kind of things that they want to be um, – Exactly, exactly. Mm, Yeah, the mm. Japanese copy with the all be on the side and all that. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm, I mean, mm, even mm. with the the Motherland project, which I mentioned before, I had four vinyl hand pressed of that project. And there were people, you know, I was posting photos of the vinyl and whatever, and people like, oh, my God, how can I get it? I'm like, well, the only way you can get it is through the NFTs. And so, you know, that became the avenue. So there's a Maybe there's a temptation there for someone who would want the vinyl more than the NFT, but there's only one way to get it. Right. So you but have at, to, at the same time, I think it's yeah. really important. Mm. Sorry, go on. I, th- I think it's really important to address the idea that that this term, like NFT, it's kind of so it's broadly kind of used by people who don't always understand what it is or how it works. And also about a year ago, because a lot of people were making a lot of money with it, it's seen as like, oh, this is how you make a lot of money. But then at the same time, there's NFTs which serve completely different purposes. I mean, with Mashy Beats, we had a remix contest where to access the contest, there was an NFT, which is like an unlock key. And that was, you know, it was like $7 or something. I wanted to price it really accessibly, but just high enough to stop the riffraff from coming in. And so people had to buy this NFT to access the contest where they could download the stems and enter a portal where they could upload their remixes. And mm. so that's a different use case. You know, an NFT is just a, it's a token on a cryptographic blockchain. That's it. It just happens that if you assign it to something and you sell it for a high price, then, that, then that's what it is. Or maybe it's a low price or maybe it's even free and it's just a, a, a key to unlock a door like a, like a membership card. So it can be so many things. It's really up to the, the person's imagination how they want to use this technology. Yeah, and I, I've noticed um, I wanted to talk to you about like, because you've really you've you've really gone into modeling a, a, like a, a new business, new music business model, going into this new world, and like you've got multiple ha- websites here that that you're involved in projects, and the um, so uh, let's let's talk about buyback the the crowdfund project. I noticed that that you reached um, your goal. By looking at this, uh, the results here is that correct? You did that. Um, tell me a bit about buyback. Yeah, at the time it raised because the 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 price of any cryptocurrency is always in fluctuation, so it's different now than it was then. At the time, it was for, around forty thousand dollars. It was raised, and the the basic principle was I wanted to raise funds in order to buy seven of my back catalog albums back from two labels who controlled them, and. You know, I have huge issues with labels as far as back catalog goes, because most labels don't know how to exploit back catalog. They won't support back catalog. And if you say to your label, hey, but what about, you know, how can we get my old stuff going? They're going to say, well, give us a new album and then that'll bring people to your old albums. And it's like, wait, I've got to make another album to get the ones that already exist to earn more. Like there's, there's no real me- me- mechanism that labels understand to exploit back catalog. And so, I mean, unless it's a legendary artist and it's being licensed and sampled or whatever it might be. But generally speaking, for the indie artist, it's a bit of a dead end. And so I recognized that I wanted to own my back catalog again. I wasn't prepared to wait out these terms or to wait out the earning back the advances. And so crowdfunding was my approach. And I did have someone hit me up at the time and be like, well, why isn't this a GoFundMe or a Kickstarter? Like, why is it on the blockchain why is it an ethereum 
And that's a fair question because it's a similar kind of model and people fundraise all the time. The difference with this was that every single person who contributed Ethereum to this crowdfund, in return, they got a token called buyback, the buyback token. And so that was proportionate to, proportional to the amount of Ethereum they contributed. And the buyback token is the governance token for Mashi Beats. What, this, what, what does this mean? So what this means is, is that Mashi Beats, at this point, forget the label. Like the label is a small part of it, but it's really more of a community than anything. Mm. The idea is, is that as a community, decisions have to be, have to be made especially when it comes to using money, which is in the community treasury or, or fundamental decisions about how the community is going to move. Because it's not, it's not a Mark de Clive Lowe community. Like I founded it, but I want to empower the people who are involved with it to have a say. And so the idea is, is that you, if you hold buyback tokens, those are your votes. That's your voting power in the community. And so- we did a remix contest and the winners were ultimately decided by the buyback holders. And so we had a project which was a and would by community, essentially. And so there's no tooling where I could have done that without using crypto. With, by using crypto and having this buyback token, if you have buyback in your wallet, that's, it can't be forged and it can't be mistaken for someone else. If you wanted to, you could give yours to someone else, send it to another wallet and they'd have some too. But fundamentally speaking, we're talking about a technology that is super, super secure. Like I've, I've said many times that if, you know, if, if government elections were on chain, there'd be no voter suppression and there'd be no fraud, like literally. So the idea that you can actually build out mechanisms in this way is, is really exciting to me. And so over two weeks, the buyback raised, it was 12 ETH at the time, around $40,000. I was able to get all seven albums back. And now those albums are basically the foundational assets of Mashy Beats. So I'm working on ways to redeploy them, to earn more money, which a percentage of which goes back into the treasury and builds these funds for Mashy Beats. And then I could say, or anyone in the community could say, make a proposal like, oh man, let's, let's, let's use this money to get an album made with like, you know, Mark and some Mashy Beats crew and Kenny Dope. And be like, do you want to do that or not? And then we put that to a vote and people vote. And so you get a, demo- a, a democratic kind of direction happening, which I think is important when you build communities is that you're empowering people to have a seat at the, ta- seat at the table. So what, how I really describe that is in my case, because of the music I'm into, that if you took my favorite labels of all time, which say if there was a jazz one, it might be Blue Note. If there was an electronic one, it might be... It might be Brain Feeder. If there was a, a house one, it might be Masters at Work or whatever it might be. If you took those labels and they were one entity altogether in their purest form, and then I could give you a seat at the table so you could help direct that label as it grows and goes, that's a fan's dream. Mm. And we don't have that kind of access. And that's, that's exactly what I'm aiming to do with Mashy Beats. Mate, this is just so fascinating, honestly. Um- I find like uh, it, it, you've built this whole kind of ecosystem here that, that's supporting this sort of new vision that you're, you're going into. And you're, you're, you're pretty, you're quite deep in it. And like for someone, um, that's just like learning about it now and a, like, where, where is a good start? And second question is, uh, where, like, how long do you think this is going to, Take before it becomes the norm across the globe. What do you think? What's your prediction on <laughs> that's, this? That's 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 the that's the golden question that ev- the crystal ball question that everyone's asking. Like, when will we have mainstream adoption of this? Mm. And to be honest, it may or may not get there. Um, I think right now, as far as the arts are concerned, and specifically music, it's a really amazing tool to raise funds, find a new level of value for your work and build fan community. I think that's, that's already been proven. Um, as far as broader adoption, mass adoption, I could conceive of a time when say, say it's a Spotify and 
there's an album you love and there's a button which adds it to your collection on Spotify. And so instead of, say, paying subscription fees, maybe, maybe that's all they have. And so you hit that button and then it's in your collection. What you don't know is that behind the scenes on the back end, that's an NFT. And you don't need to know that it's an NFT. That's the, that's the point where mass adoption is going to happen. It's kind of like there's a lot of people who do not understand the idea that when they listen to Spotify, that's MP3s streaming to your phone. They don't know what MP3s are. They don't know what bit rates are. They, don't, they wouldn't know 192 from 320. And that's not a mm. diss. It's just they don't need to know it. They just press mm. play on Spotify and the shit plays. Mm. And so when blockchain tech becomes that transparently embedded in user kind of interfaces, that's where mass adoption will have a possibility. But it's, it's interesting because the tech is not, it's not just the arts. I mean, you know, we've had global supply chain issues for the last well, since the pandemic started pretty much and it's ongoing, that kind of thing, a lot of problems can be alleviated with blockchain tech. I mean, it's, it's nothing but a ledger, which in other words is like a spreadsheet kind of <laughs> to, to make it yeah. oversimplify, but it's, it's totally secure. And unlike, unlike a spreadsheet, you can't go backwards and, and replace stuff. You can only go forwards. So every transaction is there. It's public and it's indelibly imprinted on a blockchain. And so the, the potential use for that, and I mentioned, you know, democratic elections before, there's just so many use cases which could happen. And if it, if it was an election, then as far as the voters go, all they know is that they're voting electronically. They don't need to know it's an NFT. You know, it's just, it's just, the, it's just at the moment, the technology is so nascent and so new that we're dealing with these, tech, these terminologies, you know, to the point there's... There's people who are like, oh, I'm a Web3 musician. So as soon as we can take that, um, that adjective Web3 off there and they just say, I'm a musician, then we know something's changed. Right. Because it's still, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's still in that part of the cycle. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and in terms of where someone should start. Um, yeah. Like <laughs> someone's brain, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I know that, like I mean, for me, for me, it, joining, got, being in your community and 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 a couple of others, including Soul Action as well, and just mm-hmm. kind of like that's what's yep. helped yep. me kind of learn, you know. Yeah, I mean, so so it's it's really the onus is really on the person who's interested to learn. The onus is on them to do the digging, which is how music was, right? It's like you got to go and go crate digging. It's not all, we didn't have Spotify. So it's yeah. that kind of old school mentality in a yeah, way. Yeah. Um, I don't know if maybe, maybe you have like a show notes and you can link that, um, the, the YouTube of that Zoom session I did, because that's a great intro as far as music goes. Yeah, it's a great, yeah, um, absolutely. I've been sharing that lately, actually. Oh, awesome. Great. Mm, yeah. Mm. But otherwise, like you say, it's like there's, there are these communities where you can tap in and just, I think just by l- even lurking, you pick up stuff like by osmosis and then there'll be certain things which might pique your interest and you'll want to tap through. Um, the, the, the community is definitely on Twitter. Twitter is where it's at, which is been amazing for me. Cause I remember like, you know, using Twitter back in the day and then I pretty much stopped and it was just like echoing my Instagram posts or something. And then as I got into web three, realizing, wait, the conversation is on Twitter. Everyone's on Twitter. This is where it's at. So that's kind of the top level way in. And it's really fascinating with social media platforms where say on Instagram, there's very little resonance for Web3 or NFTs. There's almost a backlash. Mm. But then on Twitter, <laughs> there's a whole subculture for it. So there, there are definitely ways in um, if people are curious. But in t- when, you say, when you say Twitter, like I know, I know that it's being used for um, group discussions and people are using that place to go to for um, just you know having an open forum for in in real yeah. time like you can he- mm-hmm. like hear people chatting and um, and so mm-hmm. how do you unless you're in a Discord though you won't know about those discussions because yeah they, I mean they, you, you absolutely mm-hmm. you absolutely mm-hmm. can you, you totally mm-hmm. can know about them okay. so for example you know one of my one of my one of my biggest interests outside of music and music and tech culture is basketball. So I follow certain people on Twitter because I'm interested, you know, pundits and people look like one of the Lakers people or whatever who it might be. And so then in my feed, I'm getting 
the newest information that's happening right. in the world of basketball because I follow yeah. people who are in that world. So it's very simple. It's like any, it's any social media feed. Like you follow shit that you're interested in and then you find the information you're looking for. Mm. And so mm. people, I know for a lot of people, it's like, okay, well, I go on Twitter now, what? Well, it's like, if you listen to this podcast interview and you're curious, come on Twitter and follow me and then look at some of the people I'm interacting with and follow them and whoever it might be. And, you know, there's an incredible German techno producer named Maelstrom who is deep in the NFT space and mm. he's on Twitter. It's like, you know, Twitter is where the conversation happens. It's, it's where you can, it's like for me, where I've connected with people which, who, which have enabled me to sell NFTs, to build collector communities. It's how I found discords that I've joined mm. and basically formed relationships with people that I would never have known. And it's, it's pretty wild. Yeah, this has been so great. Thank you so much. I, I, I tell, tell us about Everwave. This looks really awesome. Um, and I noticed that <laughs> it's a, uh, with the Solana, um, on Sol with Solana. Um, so yeah, yeah. Tell us a bit about that. Cause that's a new thing that's just started ish, newish thing. And you got a nice yeah, team of yeah, people we're, there. We're in the beta phase. Mm. Mm -hmm. We're in the beta phase right now. So. Everwave, I'm one of the co-founders, there's about uh, a dozen of us around the world. And essentially, it's a musician and producer collaborative ecosystem. And in its, that, that's in its most simplest, simplest terms. And so to break it down a little bit, so within Everwave, which is represented by a web app, so there's an app on, on a web browser, and then the community is in Discord. But on the web app, each project on Everwave is called a wave. And a wave consists of a series of productions created by producers. We call them versions. And the versions are produced using stems contributed by musicians. And so I guess it's a bit like Splice, except with Splice, you're looking at generic kind of sample packs. But with this, it's musicians iterating and contributing to a specific idea. So a wave begins with a, with a musical idea, like a seed or a demo. And then, you know, say you're a... You're a guitar player or you're an electronic soundscape creator and you like that idea, you can download it. You record yourself along to that version. You upload your stems to Everwave. And then the producer comes along, can access a stem pool, downloads stems, creates their own vision of that version, uploads it, and it joins the end of the wave. And then musicians might hear that new version and be like, oh, wow, let me jump on that. And then they iterate on the new version and the producer can update their version. Or maybe another producer comes along, grabs those same stems and creates a whole new version. And you get this feedback loop between musicians and producers, which is also really exciting in that, say, at the beginning of the wave, that, that origin idea, the seed version, might be, it might be like a little jazzy whatever. And then as the wave evolves, you could get like a techno version and a hip hop version and an ambient version and a jazz version. And all these kind of branches of the tree kind of go off. And so the, the creative, that's the creative proposition. Where crypto comes into it is that Everwave has its own governance token, the Wave token on Solana. And each Wave has its own smart contract, which I kind of meant, explained earlier. Mm -hmm. And so each Wave smart contract, at the end of a Wave, everyone who contributes creatively to this Wave goes onto the smart contract with an equal share. And they all get airdropped wave tokens, which have a value, a market value. And the idea there is, is that pretty much never in the history of music industry have, has the creative process itself been valued. Like we've been dependent on marketplace dynamics, which means anything where there's a buyer and a seller, which could be a vinyl, a t-shirt, a concert ticket, even an NFT, they're all marketplace dynamics. And so the idea we wanted to really run with is how do we reward the creative process without requiring a buyer-seller, a, mar a marketplace dynamic. And this is how we're doing it with, with the tokenomics of the wave token, where at the end of the wave, everyone gets an even, even split of the tokens that have been allocated to that wave. And once that happens, this is pretty convoluted, but anyway, once that happens, the entire wave becomes an NFT. And presuming a, a sale of that, that money goes back to the same smart contract, gets, gets dis distributed out to all the musicians and producers involved. And then a wave has all these different versions within it too. So the community votes for their favorite versions. Those become NFTs. They also go to DSPs, to Spotify and the like. They could be licensed. They could be synced. 
You know, maybe J. Cole wants to sample one, whatever it might be. Any revenue which happens to these versions outside the blockchain comes back on chain, gets converted to Wave Token, and sent out through the smart contract to everyone who contributed. So the idea is really about, I mean, it's about the fun aspect of creative collaboration firstly, but also creating a valuation around that, giving a value to our process as, as, as music creators. And on top of that, we split everything evenly. So it doesn't matter if you contributed a hand clap, if you're banging pots and pans in the kitchen, if you did a string quartet, if you, if you produce one of the versions, everything is worth the same. And that, that's kind of really imperative to our model where I think that there's been a, an ongoing struggle with this. Like, you know, I've, I've done countless sessions collaborating with people in my career and I never know what my share is going to be until after we've created and then it becomes a subjective conversation around what we think each person's contribution is worth, which is mm. never fully correct or fair. And so we're saying, well, this is a collaborative ecosystem, so fuck all that. Everything's worth the same because in true collaboration, you cannot say that one thing has more value than another. So, mm. so it's a pretty complicated kind of mecha- mechanism to it. But the, 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 the fundamental of it is really – musicians contributing ideas and producers interpolating the ideas and then the upside of it is the whole crypto kind of rollout of everwave so i don't know if i explained that in a too complicated way but that's that's the other side <laughs> yeah no no uh, it, it, this is definitely going to be one of these episodes i'm going to be repeating <laughs> but um in terms of um <laughs> it, it, in terms of the uh um uh like it sounds like it's a, the evolution of mashy beats almost like a, like it's the next sort of step level up of of the kind of sh- infrastructure of it um and uh yeah it, it it sounds it sounds super exciting i'm going to i joined the discord for that today as well so i, I i'm going to be lurking there too yeah, excellent <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, there's, there's, there's already so we're in we're in beta phase right now, and so there's going to be there's going to be three or four beta waves before you open fully to the public. But you know, you people can, can go to the web app. Um, it doesn't work on mobile at the moment, only on on web browsers. Mm. And so you can go to the web app and you can hear the waves, these three beta waves, and you can already hear some producers' different iterations of them. And it's not, I mean, it's not super dynamic because it's asynchronous collaboration. You know, it'll take a musician some time maybe in between gigs to to contribute or it might take a producer some time to create their version but the whole system is there waiting and ready for them so you know what the 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 goal is like you know say there's 10 or 20 waves going at a time and then you're a producer or a dj or a guitarist and maybe you're like oh, let me just mess around with a wave before i go to the gym or before i do my session and just just have a it's like a playground like it's not that deep it's just a playground. Mm. And how, how for, have you seen similar kind of other models like this? So the, this model does, doesn't exist in music at all, but it, the, there are two references we have. One is from DeFi, which is um, decentralized finance. DeFi was a huge movement last year in the crypto space, it had to do with basically, um, basically investing your investing tokens in a project and getting a payout for investing that's the idea of in DeFi, which is a, it's a very simplistic overview of something called liquidity mining and we've taken that concept rebranded it creativity mining and that's the premise of how we can pay out tokens for the creative process and then there's also a thing in web3 gaming which is basically they call it play to earn so a game will have its tokens and by completing levels of a game you earn tokens so this is very similar in that respect because if you look at a wave like a game or a quest you complete the quest you earn tokens it's as simple as that this has never been done on music though like the the web3 music model right now is make your music mint it as an nft and then do your best salesman act and try and sell it which is not easy and not all music creators are cut out to be salesmen or even or want to right so it's important to us that we're offering an alternative paradigm and also addressing the fact that the, an NFT, the NFT is not the end game of blockchain technology. It's just one step along the way. Like there's so much more to come and it's, it's unimaginable. I mean, you know, you, you imagine like someone's DJing in the club and 
every track they're playing has an NFT assigned to it. And I mean, frankly, this is what I, ISRC codes should have done, but have never actually done. And then a DJ is playing in the club and every track they play is being registered on the blockchain. And so there's, you know, say some of, the, some of that DJ's fee, heaven forbid, is going to the people who actually made the music they're spinning. And then the DJ who wants to really maximize that, they spin their own music. Like, go for it. I mean, th- those are things which can actually move the needle forward rather than backwards. With Mashy Beats, because it, it, was, it, was, your, it was your label and, and, and you set up this community now that it's evolved and um, you got the crowdfunding and how do you and, – and now that there's this community involved, um, do, how, do, how is the business sort of company structure set up? Like do you, do you pay yourself a wage or out of, out of, out of that and, and then other funding is, is then distributed to the contributors on certain projects? And then so um, – and then, yeah, if you can answer that first, and then I'll, I've got another question about eWave as well. <laughs> For sure. So I would say that Mashy Beats as a Web3 community or as a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization, which is a fancy name for a, a web-based community that can operate by itself without leadership. Um, so Mashy Beats as a Web3 community is still very nascent. It's still very young. And it's not what I would term in business terms, a profit making entity at the moment. And so for me, it's an investment of my time and energy to build something that I believe can grow. And so what that comes down to is, I mentioned before the buyback token, which we use for governance, for kind of um, voting on, on proposals and stuff. The buyback token has no inherent value in, in, in monetary terms. Like you could try and sell it, but there's no, there's no value to it. It's a functional token. Mm. And so as well as that, we have a second token called Mashi. And the Mashi coin is, we say Mashi Beats is fueled by a Mashi coin. And so Mashi coin, we use that to, to reward community contributors, like someone who might do a, do a guest mix on the Discord or, or be, the spot, be on the, under the spotlight for an interview or the remix competition winners, along with getting pressed on vinyl and minted as NFTs and getting sound libraries, they also got Mashy Coin. So we use that as a, as a reward system and an incentivization system. And so Mashy Coin does have a value. And so if, hypothetically speaking, you know, if you have a thousand Mashy Coin, which is not worth that much today, but you have a thousand Mashy Coin, the community grows, the coin use grows. Therefore, the value goes up and therefore your thousand Mashi coin become worth more. I mean, that's, that's the basic premise of crypto tokens, period. So we have a token which does that. And so, for example, even like we even we, we give Mashi coin rewards to the most active Discord members each month. And so even through that, you know, someone's super active. They're building up this 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 kind of amount of Mashi coin in their wallet and then the coin value goes up over time as we grow and the value they have goes up over time as we grow and they can cash that out if they want, they can hang on to it, they could gift it, they could do whatever they want with it. So that's kind of where the business model as such would come in. And then also, you know, if I'm personally looking at, um, I guess, extracting financial value from what I'm building, then that's the idea of, for example, if I do an NFT drop or something, and it's like that community is more likely to have people who will support it than people outside that community. Or maybe, they'll, maybe they can't afford to support it, but they'll help amplify it. So whatever mm. it might be, I think there's value in the community, and which may be, it might be indirect. It might not be like a direct one-to-one transaction of like, I've built this, therefore I earn X. Like that's not the model. Mm. It's more like, a, a holistic ecosystem where this, this, this community feeds other aspects and everything resonates. And ultimately, if it's growth, growth gets reflected in our world through money. In terms of the, the, the part where, where you did the crowdfunding to get your music back and then you've got um, what was $40,000 equivalent. Um, now, mm-hmm. that's... That, that's your money, right? That's like that's your funding that goes. I back. mean, every 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 penny of that went to the labels. 
that's what I, that's the money I used to buy back the masters. Ah, so the funds, right. So the, yeah, so the, but, but now that the masters are there to mm-hmm. support the Mashy Beats project or the Mashy Beats mm-hmm. as a whole now, cause it's, it lives there now. Yeah, exactly. So the idea with that and essentially it's something I'm still working on building. Like there's a, the thing with the space is it's so, I mean, nascent is a word I will use over and over again. And it, for those not sure, it means kind of at the very beginning of. So the thing with this whole tech in the space, it's so nascent that oftentimes you might have an idea and there's no way, there's no existing tooling to do it. But, and this is what I'm, my, the, my mentor who brought me into the space told me in the very beginning. He was saying to me, if you have an idea and a couple of other people think it's a dope idea, you can make it happen. And Everwave is proof of concept with that. Like I was the third co-founder to come on board and now it's actually happening a year later, we've built it. And so for example, with my catalog, one thing I want to build, which doesn't exist in the space right now is a really robust way to present albums and have them on the blockchain. And so that's something in development right now, which ideally, if I can put the whole back catalog on chain in, in a specific presentation, and then say, you know, maybe it's kind of arbitrarily up to me, but I might say, okay, so 50% of all income from this catalog goes to the Mashy Beats treasury. And then the treasury has funds which can be deployed for projects. And I could easily be, I guess, more selfish about it and say, it's my music, it's all coming to me. But ultimately, right now, forget Web3 in traditional terms. Back catalog, it's not earning a whole lot of money. So it's not like, it's kind of neither here nor there for me. But if it can earn more money and some of that money can be used to build something that has its own sustainability, that is autonomous, and that I, I have a heavy hand in kind of in, 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 in focusing the direction, to me, that's really exciting. You know, so none of us are able to be lone, lone wolves, basically. <laughs> yes. No, no. I, I, and that, that's what I love about this. Um, this whole um, space is that is the um, collaborative um, efforts and and the the concept of working together, and it, it, it's proven time and time again that even just like we look in in real life, like it's just it, it's a no brainer. Like it just makes sense to be working together with people and creating cool shit, you know. So. Um, in, in terms it, of ever really does man yeah, yeah yeah absolutely like when you work together you you we we lift each other up like it's it's almost you know um yeah it, yeah <laughs> um in terms of ever I, I, I would say i would say yeah. I would just just to t- just to tie that up quickly i would say also <laughs> that in the music industry by and large through my given my experience in the last 20 years which has covered both the DJ dance world and the jazz world, I've seen so much scarcity mentality and gatekeeping and lack of collaboration and, and people kind of clicks with who won't kind of open the doors and all this bullshit, which on the one hand, it kind of supports the subculture scene and its development. On the other hand, it's like, who, who the fuck do you think you are to, to stop someone else getting something? And so the, the fundamental premise in Web3 and the blockchain, where there's scarcity in the music industry, in blockchain, it's abundance. It's like there's so much. Yes, exactly. And the only yeah. way we get there is if there's a collaborative movement towards the goal. Yeah. And you, you, could, say, you could say that scarcity mentality is actually the manifestation of the, the shitty business model. Like it's what has... The old oh, yeah. business model oh, yeah. is yeah, it's 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 made it's, it's separate it's separated us. It separates humans. It like mm-hmm. yeah, um, yes. Now, in terms of Everwave, like uh, going back to sort of infrastructure and model, like you mentioned, it you're one of the founders, and so there's obviously going to be a team of people who had to initially lay down funding to get that off the ground. Like the, so, therefore, mm-hmm. you guys are. That team who, who who invested in that in the beginning are the the founders, but yet so you guys have to get paid back for that, 
and then the rest of the model follows or like just if you could just kind of elaborate a little bit on that for me. Yeah. So a fairly, I mean, it's all relative, but a fairly considerable amount of money has been spent over the last year in developing Everwave to get it to the point it's at now. And that's been a combination of bootstrapping and angel investors. Um, we're looking at VC funding at the moment, um, which is a very standard practice in the Web3 space, building something, have VC funding to, to give it um, runway to, to, to grow. And for me, um, and this is pretty standard across most Web3 projects, founders have a basically a founder but token bonus allocation. So, you know, personally, I have an amount of tokens of Everwave tokens. And if the project does well, then the value of those increases. If it doesn't do well, then it doesn't. And it's, it's a, you know, it's an absolute, it's a, it's a risk, no question. And it could absolutely fall flat on its face. You know, we believe in it, but it's also, it's a slightly more complicated kind of um, concept than a music NFT. Or something like that. So it's, I mean, it's hard work, but that's, that's the, that would be the kind of financial payoff. There's risk in anything that you, any business venture that you like doesn't really. Totally. Like, yeah. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> it's, we're, we're all really taking a stab in the dark for those who want to create a, um, a you know, an, a, and be business owners. So like we are all really taking a risk, you know. What's wild about this to me, especially, and not just Everwave, but this whole moment in history, is that this is the first time in the history of music where creators, aka musicians or music makers, are on a par with the development of new technology and the evolution of new systems and mechanisms. Up to this point in time, we've always been behind the ball. For example, when the, when the long play record was, was invented, then they said to musicians, oh, now you can make a 45-minute album. Then the CD got invented. They're like, now you can go up to 74 minutes. Then it's MP3s. Now you have to do MP3s. Now it's Spotify. Now you have to stream. So we've always been playing catch up with both mm. the technology and the rules of how this technology works. But with blockchain tech, we're right on time. So th this, is, this is a situation right now where I can, I can hit up a builder or a founder of almost any platform and ask a question or have an idea and they may implement it immediately or they might not or but that 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 door is open like i can't go and knock on google's door and like suggest something it's not even an option or everwave like i couldn't you know i couldn't be a music tech builder 5 years ago like what would i do again go door knocking at google like it's not they're not going to mm. listen and so the idea that we have access to this infrastructure and technology that we can be part of the building at the same time as it's happening is truly exciting to me. Yeah, no, it makes it makes total sense why it's so exciting. I think it 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 um I I believe this is the definitely the future and I believe this is where 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 things are going like 100%. Um I see that more clearly now and I um uh, I, I really urge people to to um, start learning because I think it's going to be a massive, massive thing happening, like a, a rush in the next couple of years. I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, especially if you're a, if you're a creator in the in the independent sector specifically, mm. like it's it's not a friendly space for major labels. It's not a friendly space for huge artists. Um, you know, Snoop Dogg is one of the few people who've come in and done well as far as huge artists go. But he's come in and done it from an independent mentality and without any label backing. But like for a Sony or a Universal Music Group to come into the space, they're going to be met with a lot of cynicism. Once it goes mainstream, then they'll be able to do whatever they want. But in the meantime, we're really looking at independent artists having very powerful mechanisms which enable them to be as present as a bigger artist. Yeah, I noticed I know when I started to... Um, learn about NFTs. I noticed like um, both Snoop and um, Russell Simmons were doing like these baseball card type, uh, you know, legends of hip hop. I don't know where that project's gone now, but 
but you got these images of, say, Slick Rick or, mm-hmm. you know, Run DMC, and they were like baseball cards with music attached to it. And I was like, what is this, man? Like, and, and, and I, for me, and I, and, I, and I know Russell Simmons is like really deep in it as well. And, um, and I, it just, it, it, I don't know, for me, that was kind of like my indicators. Like, if these cats like this are doing, are, are involved and they're dabbling in, then there's definitely something going on. And, yeah, and, definitely. Yeah, and, 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 you know, he recently bought, uh, Snoop bought the, the whole catalogue of uh, Death Row and just turning it, turning it into a whole NFT label. It's an NFT yeah. label, exactly. Yeah, mm, yeah. it's crazy. Um, and I remember you mentioning how what, what's happening in LA now, like just like um, sport, you know, in, in sports, the players – uh, your sports clubs are being sponsored by crypto. Or the arena is now like all these sort of things are. Uh, it, it's evolving. It's happening. It's it's happening. Mm. And the and the the really interesting thing happening right now is that we're in what's referred to as a bear market. So the market crashed um, earlier this year, mm-hmm. and it hasn't recovered. It's potentially in a crypto winter for God knows how long. And so the fascinating thing with that is is that. No matter what happens to the value of Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever it might be, the technology is always going to be there. And the tech is what's interesting. And I think building things that work is what creates value. And so the idea of, of uh, the kind of economic bubble that happened kind of mid-pandemic, that, that was what attracted a lot of people as far as you can make a lot of money here. But then the ones who really understand the tech... When, when the market crashed, they didn't go anywhere. Like where this is when in a bear market where the market's low, that's the best time to build. So for us, especially with EverWave, it's like this is perfect. Like this is yeah. a time to be building this and getting this out there. And we have a committed belief. I mean, everyone I know in the space has a committed belief that long term, the value of these of, of the cryptocurrencies is, is going to go back up. Um, you know, for example, and not to get too much into economics, but I'll keep it super simple. But when the 2018 bear market happened, the value of Bitcoin and Ethereum was approximately one tenth of what it is now. So here we are, five years later, four years later, with the next crash, but the bottom of the market is 10x the bottom at the last crash. Mm. And so, in my mind, there's no way to look at that and not say it's a positive thing. <laughs> That's progression. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it, uh, you're right, and it seems this is like because I'm hearing this as well is that people are, are building right now. People are building, Absolutely. yeah. People are in a building, yeah. building phase um, for this new new era. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to to um, wrap up today's conversation and share about other projects that you're working on that you'd like to to, to cover? I mean, there's there's a blur of projects. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> And it's, um, which is really fun. It's like, I'm, you know, I have multiple albums I'm finishing at the same time, building out projects for Mashy Beats. And I mean, one thing we are doing kind of keeping in context of today's conversation is that with Mashy Beats, we are about to launch an an initiative with the buyback to essentially increase the governance membership. So increase the number of people who hold buyback tokens and also build the community treasury i.e. create funds that can be voted on to be deployed for projects. And so that's going to start rolling out in about, a, actually in about a week and a half um, with a, a new drop on Sound XYZ every two weeks. And the majority of those funds, like 70% or something, will go to the community treasury. So that's going to be a, an interesting kind of experiment. Um, essentially, you know, dropping regularly, like, you know, people would say before, like, whether it's you got to post on Instagram every day or drop on Spotify every week or whatever it is. Well, I'm going to tr- try that. I'm going to drop an NFT every two weeks and, build and, and see what we can build that way. Um, and then just, you know, super excited for what we're doing with Everwave and just seeing where that goes and more than anything to see the musical results because people contribute an idea and it can become a whole other idea. And that's just exciting. Like every music maker started making music because it's fun like the no one likes doing administration or anything else we, we just want to have fun and make music there's a reality in life where we do have to administrate we've got to learn stuff outside of our basic kind of music skill 
And um, that said, it comes down to having fun. And so for me, I'm having a ball and seeing other people create and have fun with what they're doing. And then there's this kind of galvanizing umbrella over everyone, everyone which is Web3. So it's, it's a very exciting time. And yeah, for any, I, I would just encourage people who, like the people who are curious are going to learn. I would love to encourage the naysayers to have an open mind and just to understand that the music industry has been totally fucked for the last hundred years. And here's an opportunity to, to turn in a different direction. And so I would encourage people just to be open-minded about it. Well, you certainly, certainly have, uh, t- you know, I, I recommend people to, to take a, uh, just a page out of your book over the, these last couple, few years and, and, um, and see how you're created a, an ecosystem that it is proving to work and you, you're connecting with amazing people around the world and, um, and it's, it seems like you're heading into the right direction um, even more so. And look, thank you so much again for today and, um, and jumping on board during your busy schedule. Um, it's been awesome. Um, Absolute this was, pleasure, man. This was awesome, chat. awesome, awesome chat. Thank you so much, Mark. You're welcome. 